Um, we are recording this session. Welcome to Dancing Out Loud, Thoughts on Navigating the Rhythms of Life with author Elaine Robnett Moore. So excited to talk with Elaine about her, her wonderful book. And I'm so glad you could join us. We are recording this session as we, we have many people who couldn't be here who want to watch it and have requested we record it. Um, before we get started, I'd like to tell you about a few other things Silver Spring Town Center has coming up. We, we just had a whirlwind of activity last month with our Blues Festival and Silver Spring Blues Week. I know many of you were able to join us and enjoy wonderful blues music. Uh, at the festival and throughout the week. Uh, our newsletter went out today and has a lot of photos from, from the, all the events. And our, this, the theme of our newsletter is actually inspired by Elaine's book and Dancing Out Loud. And we talk about different ways that um, people live life with, with gusto. And, and we have um, our art salon coming up on Wednesday at five o'clock, and we're going to talk about uh, how you express exuberance through your work. So the art salon is for artists, musicians, and other creatives um, to gather and share ideas. And so this art salon will be on this Wednesday at 5 p.m on the patio of El Golfo. We are also starting a new series of performances, music and comedy um, at El Golfo on most Wednesdays called Wonderful Wednesdays. And this, um, this Wednesday evening, we have a youth ensemble. They're an excellent jazz ensemble and they're going to do a variety of music. Um, and they are called 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> so they are great uh, musicians who have performed with us on the plaza. Speaking of Veterans Plaza, we have Twilight Tuesdays every Tuesday, and tomorrow we have Flow Arts, and then on third Tuesdays we have Salsa at the Plaza with All Out Danza, led by Victor Masonette, wonderful choreographer, who is our SSTCI Star of the Month featured in our newsletter that just went out. I'll put our newsletter in the chat in case you didn't get it. Um, we also have, um, well, during summer, we have mostly outdoor in-person events. But uh, as I've mentioned, uh, we also have another Zoom program. And that's two weeks from tonight. It's called The Numbers Game in the Burbs. Racketeering in Montgomery County with historian David Rotenstein. So it's Monday, July 25th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And David is, is an excellent historian um, who's, who's passionate about Black communities, uh, Jewish communities, especially in our area. So um, he and his wife actually moved out of the area to Pittsburgh to be closer to family, but they, he's able to do a program with us since we are doing some of our programs still virtually. So join us for the Numbers Game in the Burbs Racketeering in Moco two weeks from tonight. Um, and then we also have a very special event also in person and outdoor on the patio of El Paso. Um, and it's with author Will Jawando, who will be sharing his, his newly released book, My Seven Black Fathers, a young activist's memoir of race, family, and the mentors who made me whole. And we will be presenting him on Wednesday, July 27th at, at six o'clock at El Golfo Restaurant's patio. It's a wonderful patio. So please join us. Um, and all of our events are made possible with generous support from Montgomery County, United Therapeutics, the Arts and Humanities of Montgomery County, Maryland State Arts, Montgomery College, and many others. And now let's get to the program. I will, I will introduce our presenter and dear friend, Elaine Robnett Moore is a fifth generation internationally renowned artist whose mediums of choice are beaded jewelry and the written word. Elaine has worked as an international development consultant and a master teacher in Africa, the Caribbean, France, Malaysia, and the United States. 
working with bead artists and creative makers. Her work is exhibited internationally and is published. She has served on the board of directors and as president of the Bead Society of Greater Washington. She served on the board of directors of the Bead Museum in Washington, DC. And um, in May of 2013, Elaine was commissioned by the government of Rwanda to write the country's first training manual, uh, Professional Jewelry Making with Beads. The second edition of her book, The Art of Bead Stringing, Artist to Entrepreneur, Entrepreneur was published April 2015 in the United States. In April of 2016, she was appointed to the Board of Directors of the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County, Maryland. Welcome, Elaine, Robnett Moore, and Thank you. Thank this you. wonderful Thank book, which I just got the other day from you, finally. And mm -hmm. it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful book with um with so many um nuggets of wisdom and wonderful quotes and and slices of life stories and also pictures of your of your beautiful beadwork interspersed and i also love the cover which which shows shows you at the at a very young age and i and and we can see you were um an inquisitive child Absolutely. reaching for higher things um do you remember when you took this photo? Of course not. I do. <laughs> I do remember that it was always one of my favorite photos, and it definitely is symbolic of what I think life should be about, which is always reaching up to the next level or for the next dream or for the next challenge, one or the other. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I will turn it over to you. And I, I know um, people m might have questions or comments they can add in the chat throughout. We'll also have time. Uh, Elaine can welcome your questions. Um, so take, take it away, Elaine. Thank you. Well, let me start by saying it is wonderful to be with you again. Uh, and I welcome this opportunity to present my book, Dancing Out Loud, Thoughts on Navigating the Rhythms of Life, uh, and just to share with the community at large uh, the idea of writing a book, for instance, uh, especially for the elders. Uh, it, it's such an excellent way to leave your footprint with your descendants. Uh, I think that's very important. And one of the reasons that I chose to write this book was because I have wonderful, wonderful photos of my ancestors all the way back to the early 1800s. And the women in the family, in many instances, are very elegant and very uh, uh, stately but there are no words from the women. I know that what the men did is recorded, but what the women did, and from looking at the photos of these women, I know that they were not quiet and sitting in the corner. I know they were actively involved, um, but we have no words from them as such. So I thought that it was important for my descendants and I have five children and 18 grandchildren and great grandchildren and so on. So, well, it isn't so on past that, not yet, but eventually. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so, so I wanted, wow. I wanted to leave for them what my words are because I am primarily an artist. While my background was business, I was in real estate and then and did development in real estate and then did international business consulting and, uh, and worked with creative makers and jewelry designers all over the world. I love what I do. I'm absolutely passionate about it and, and, and I have no intentions of ever retiring because I can't imagine what I would do with my time if it wasn't committed to the things I love and that I'm passionate about, and especially because most of my work centers around women and women need to be celebrated and, and recognized for the value they bring to the table. 
in all instances. And so I chose to leave my footprint in this way so that my descendants will at least know why they may be a little, they may be a little crazy because their, their ancestor was certainly crazy. There's no question about that. I accept being crazy. I've not been stupid, but I have always been crazy. And, uh, and I don't have normal children or grandchildren because I wouldn't know what to do with normal. They all have, are very special and have very wonderful gifts. Uh, several of them are artists. Um, the art in my family goes so far back. Um, and I think that's important. But so the book came out of that. And uh, I've shared this before, but I'll say it again for anyone who doesn't know. On my 60th birthday, um, I was having a huge party in celebration of my 60th birthday. And I wanted to give a gift to all of those who attended. So since I had had this in mind for a long time to at least put quotes I thought were relevant to uh, growth and success in life, I wanted to give, I thought I would put 60 quotes I had found to be true in the course of my lifetime together for all of those who attended my birthday party. So I put them together in a little pamphlet and it was the easy something to do, just had it printed up. And, and I asked an artist friend of mine, uh, Gina Lewis to, to design a cover for it. And she came over and she looked and she's a fabulous painter with uh, Bowie State uh, University. And uh, she came over and looked at my photo albums and said, well, let's take a look at your pictures. And she came up with this picture and she said, why don't you just pick out a picture of you as a child and that's what we'll use. And this was the photo um, because again, it represents reaching up always. And, and, and that's how I like to think. This was 17 months old and, it, it, and the picture's taken in my grandmother's backyard and, and my father's mother's backyard. So I always loved that photo for that reason. Um, as a result, the quotes were so well received that folks were sending me requests for more books and uh, for would be more um, commercially published. And so I talked with a friend of mine who's an artist, uh, who's a, a renowned writer, uh, Jabari Asim, and his wife, Liana, and they said, well, by all means, you should do it, and but add the photos of your jewelry since that's what you do primarily now. And in the meantime, expand the chapters so it's not just the quote, but it also has a definition of how that quote has impacted your life. Thus, the reason or the, the, the way that Dancing Out Loud came to be a reality. It only took me 16 years. And I changed the number of quotes in it to 80. I have not reached 80 yet, although I'm close, but I'm not there yet. It's just that I had a few more quotes because I'm one of those people who always has one more something to say. So um, with that, uh, I'll give you excerpts. The chapters are all very short. And what I'd like to do is read a chapter. And if there are questions, we can stop and answer those and then I'll read another chapter. They're not gonna be in any order. This book does not require an order. It's just quotes. It's one of those books that you can open to any page and there's a bit of wisdom, a quote and a story behind it. So you could say this is a memoir of my life so far. And with that, we'll start with, I think one of the most important quotes which is celebrate, well, the chapter is called Celebrate New Beginnings, and it's the first chapter. And the quote is, what the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls a butterfly by Richard Bach. This quote is a major linchpin in the foundation of my life. Once upon a time, someone very dear gave me a copy of this book, Illusions by Richard Bach. This quote is found in the book, as well as several other quotes that I find helpful. In times when things look the bleakest or when the world seems to be crashing around you, 
think about this. It is at these moments that we should look for the bigger picture. Every ending is a new beginning, a beginning that is something greater, more beautiful, and more fulfilling than anything you can imagine. In my life, there are thousands of examples, some big, some small, which validate these words. The following one resonates because it reminds me of how different my life would be, but for the turn of events that brought me to this place. I owned a travel agency. I bought it, convinced it was what I wanted to do the rest of my life. I loved arranging travel for individuals and groups. I loved working as a tour operator and convention and meeting planner, as well as traveling with groups and assuring that my clients travels were without incident. However, after a few years with the introduction of the internet and discount travel packages, the business began losing momentum. In addition, as much as I loved working with people, I detested the endless bookkeeping part of the business. Had it not eventually become necessary to close it, I don't think I would be here now, creating amazing jewelry, teaching, writing, and consulting. In a million years, I could not have dreamed of anything as enjoyable, rewarding, and fulfilling as being the artist I have become. To be clear though, at that time, that moment in time, I thought all was lost. I thought it was the end of the world. What saved me was this quote, it kept me open. It allowed me to see new possibilities, new beginnings. Look for the butterfly. That quote ha has resonated throughout my life for so many years. I, I, it is difficult to even remember when first it was introduced, but I think it was maybe about 45 years ago um, or more. And, and it, it's still to this day, anytime I get a little down, I think about that quote and I go right back to where I need to be, which is moving on to the next chapter. This chapter is the seventh and chapter in the book and it's called No Coincidences, Opportunity is Knocking. There are no coincidences. There is a reason for everyone who crosses your path. Stay alert. As you recognize opportunity when it knocks, say alert, alert so you can recognize opportunity when it knocks, whispers, shouts, calls, or texts. That's my quote, ERM. There is an expression that speaks to missed opportunities. It is sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. Translated, this means we are presented with opportunities all of the time, and quite often we don't recognize them. In my world, every time I meet anyone, no matter their position or station in life, it presents an occasion to explore new possibilities. How often have you looked back and realized a chance encounter resulted in a lifelong friendship or a resolution to a situation you had labored over? When least you expect it, opportunity knocks. My best example happened four months after I started making jewelry. A friend arranged an introduction for me to meet the owner of an African clothing store in Washington, DC. I contacted the owner and set up an appointment to come by the store and show him my jewelry. The idea was that if he liked my work, he would agree to purchase peeps, pieces to be sold in the store. On the appointed day, I arrived on time for our meeting and was excited about the possibilities, uh, the possible outcome, only to find out he and his wife had gone to New York City to buy merchandise for the store. He had forgotten about the appointment. The gentleman who was taking care of the store identified himself as the owner's best friend. Uh, it is in these moments when it is hard to remember that something good comes from everything. So I asked him if he would be kind enough to look at my work and let the owner know what he thought about it. 
That way, if he didn't like it, he could convey that to the owner. This would enable the owner to bow out of meeting with me and save both of us some time. He agreed. When he wait, while he waited on other customers, I laid out the pieces I had brought. He looked at them, liked them, and asked if I had thought about showing them to the Smithsonian Museums. I thanked him and said that I didn't know anyone at the Smithsonian. I explained that I was not comfortable cold calling, a sales term that means calling on someone without an introduction, uh, cold calling the buyers at the Smithsonian stores. He said, well, what if you knew someone in the National Museum of African Art gift shop? Would you consider that a good enough connection? I assured him I would. He said, well, I am the manager of the National Museum of African Art gift shop. He then proceeded to give me the buyer's name and number and suggested that I use his name when I called. I did. And as a result, my pieces were sold at the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art, the Remwick Gallery, the Arts and Industry Museum, and the National Museum of Natural History for several years. The lesson, open the door when opportunity is knocking. Be creative. If the front door is locked, try the back door or the windows. Sometimes an unexpected path will lead to a better outcome. Be flexible, don't give up, and leave the door open. After all, the universe awaits the joy you can bring. Opportunity is knocking. I have found that this is true no matter what. It remains true to this day. And the more we leave ourselves open to opportunities, the more opportunities present themselves. The interesting thing is we don't always recognize them. I, if looking at this guy in that shop, I wouldn't have known that's what he did and that's what he was. He was just behind the counter in the shop, but you never know. Trust your intuition. Pay attention to your inner voice, spirit, divine self. Remember your first thought is usually the right one. Should you have doubts, let's run a little test. Think of the times you have had a phenomenal uh, premonition concerning something you were about to embark upon. When you paid attention to those feelings or listened to your inner voice, all went well. When you did not, things often turned out to be a hot mess. I can definitely attest to the hot mess part. I learned a long time ago to listen to my inner voice. I have many examples of how this works. The following is just one. Several years ago, I had to drive one of my then teenage daughters to the airport in St. Louis, Missouri, which is where I'm from. This was before for the airport security we know of today. So one could arrive literally minutes before the flight and go straight to the gate. As usual for me in those days, I had left my office late to pick up my daughter to get her to the airport. There were two routes I could take. The one I usually took was west on Highway 40. It was scenic and I thought safer. The other was west on Highway 70, which went through a rougher part of the city and had a history of more accidents. There was a point at which I had to decide which route I would take. When I reached the crossroad, my intuition said turn right and take Highway 70. Because I had already learned to listen, I turned right. My daughter asked, why are you going that way? I replied, something tells me it's the best way to go today. Since all of my children were familiar with my beliefs, they were very tolerant children. She said, okay. Within 10 minutes of the airport in the middle lane of the highway and going about 60 miles per hour, one of my tires blew out. This left my Chrysler station wagon with no power steering. 
I don't know if you guys have ever had that, but it is not fun. The car started to swerve dangerously. My daughter nervously asked, are we going to be okay? To which I responded, yes, your seatbelt is fastened and we took the route we were supposed to take. I regained control of the car. Immediately there was an exit um, and the other lanes were empty. So with difficulty, I was able to maneuver over three lanes and take the exit. This exit was in a residential area where it would be unusual for commercial businesses to be located. By the way, this was before cell phones, which limited my ability to get help. My daughter asked, am I going to make my flight? I said, absolutely. And once again, I stated that by taking the route intuitively designated meant everything would work out. My daughter relaxed, waiting to see how she was going to get to the airport. As we got to the end of the exit ramp, there in the middle of this quiet residential area was an auto repair shop. We were about six minutes away from the airport with 10 minutes to get to the gate. There sat a taxi parked on the lot of the auto repair shop. I pulled into the garage lot went in and asked for the driver of the taxi. I should mention that I had forgotten to take my wallet when I left the office. All I had was a $10 bill. The, the cab driver said $10 would get my daughter to the airport. I kissed her goodbye, put her on, in the taxi and off she went. Now there was the issue of my car. I went back into the shop and asked the attendant if I could please use his phone. I needed to call my office to have someone bring my wallet to the, um, bring my wallet to pay for the repair of the tire. He said, you don't remember me. But two years ago, I attended a lecture on entrepreneurship you gave at Forest Park Community College in St. Louis. He told me that it was because of that lecture that he had decided to open the auto repair shop, saying he had always wanted to thank me. So fixing my tire was the least he could do. The blown tire did not cause an accident. My daughter made her flight. The tire was repaired. And I met someone whose life had been changed because of something I had said years before all because I listened to that inner voice. Trust your intuition. I don't think I have to say much about that, but that intuition plays such a heavy role in our lives. And if we just listen to it, it's that little voice that's in the back of your head or in your heart that just lets you know when something's okay and when it's not. This next chapter is called Dare. It won't do you any harm if it doesn't do you any good. Apply this to what you are considering, then go ahead, take a chance. Nana. This quote comes from my Nana, who was an amazing woman way ahead of her time. She was an artist, a pianist, who was once as a teenager invited to play with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. Later, she worked with Scott Joplin as his, as he, as his assistants, assistant, helping him compose music. Because she was young and Mr. Joplin had a scandalous reputation, her mother always chaperoned her. Nana owned the first African-American dance studio west of the Mississippi River taught ballet, tap, toe, and contemporary dance. She was taught by a European ballet master. She also taught typing at Sumner High School in St. Louis. She traveled extensively throughout the United States, Mexico, Canada, and Cuba. When I was a young adult, she would say, it won't do you any harm if it doesn't do you any good. How profound is that? I consider it the foundation for many of the turns I have taken on my life's journey. She would say, think about what you want to do. If it can't harm you, 
then what's to stop you from taking a chance? This has always helped me to step out there. I love the way it empowers me. There will be times in life when you want to attempt something new or different. If, you're, if you hesitate because you are afraid, you may be missing the chance of a lifetime. I offer you these wise words of my Nana that I use as a measure whenever I am faced with these kinds of decisions. If it won't do you any harm, if it doesn't do you any good, applies, then why not try it? You may have to read this a few times to understand it. She believed in making things happening, happen, taking chances and going on adventures. Thanks to her wisdom, I have gone parasailing in the Bahamas, sailing in the Caribbean, tree walking in Ghana, hiking through a jungle to see orangutans on the island of Borneo, flown in single engine, twin engine and seaplanes. I have written books, met presidents, the most memorable was Obama, spent a day with Maya Angelou, dined with princes, helped birth seven babies, taken walks outside during a pandemic and on and on. Hopefully my, my adventures will inspire my children, grands, friends, and others to live life to the fullest. Adventures are memories you will cherish and revisit the rest of your life. What is your next exciting memory going to be? Dare. I'm certainly happy to welcome any questions as I go. If there are any, um, you can either put them in the chat or, um, or raise your hand or something. Uh, I'm not sure how that works, Lisa. Yes, I see that um, Robin wrote, yay, parasailing in the Bahamas. My sister on the call lives there, exhilarating. <laughs> oh, and trust me, it is, it is. I, it's so interesting because I'm afraid of heights. I love flying in planes, but if you tell me to walk up a, or walk down a fire escape, I may be there for several months at, on end. Yet I will be strapped into a seat on a on a um, for, to go parasailing and love every second of it. So, it's a wonderful thing. And um, oh, I didn't mean to replace myself, but I I wanted to expand on on the discussion of travel here. We we've invited you to be on our pan our next panel, follow your bliss panel, which is uh, featuring. Um, people who are avid world travelers. And so that's why I invited you to come. And we're, we're holding that event at the Coiner Farm on Sunday, the 21st, along with um, an SSTCI summer potluck picnic. So that's at 4 p.m. We'll have the panel discussion. They're always very fascinating discussions. And, uh, and then a picnic social time with uh, people in the community. So, can you talk to us a little about how travel has played a role, an important role in your life? Oh, it and played a role. Um, I started traveling when I was a child. My mother and father believed in travel. And so we traveled um, around the country and to Mexico and, and the places that were within keeping of in Canada. Uh, it, these are the places we went when I was a child. Um, I think I've been to most of the states. Um, I can't remember the number now, but I think uh, 46 of the states at least. Um, and, and that's an important thing. Um, your, your boundaries are endless when you travel. It is so important. Your appreciation of other cultures, your appreciation of the humanity of all people and the oneness of all of us is expanded on and heightened with travel. Um, when we can lose ourselves in other worlds and other cultures, we really, really take on a whole different way of looking at life. And that's so important. And it's so wonderful. And people will say, well, what's your favorite place? Well, I don't know, where was the last place I was? Because every time I'm in some place new, 
with a few exceptions, I love it. it but it's a different experience than others. And so that's the reason why. It's, it's, and it certainly has colored my life and that of my children and grandchildren because they all travel. The daughter that was talked about um, in the, in the um, story about taking her to the airport, my, when, my, when she was a teenager, if you said, okay, we're gonna go someplace, she would say, okay. And she would say, should I pack hot or cold clothes? And that was it. She didn't even have to know where she was going. It was just, okay, I'm ready to go. So I think the travel is important and sets a foundation that is very beneficial to, to you as you navigate this journey. Um, okay. um, mm -hmm. So Juanita wrote in the chat that your Nana sounds super cool and she would have loved to have met her. And I, I want to add that, uh, I think grandmothers are so, so important in our lives. My, my mom, Barbara, is on this call, tuning in from San Diego. Her mom was, um, you know, such an important part of my life, my nanny, as I called her. And um, so I, I also am a proponent of grandmas. And uh, I think that I always, I always felt sorry for kids who didn't live near their grandparents. I so, think you're right. I like to add that um, because I feel very strongly about that. My family is not just those by blood, but extends way beyond that. So I have lots of children and lots of grandchildren that are not by blood. The ones I mentioned are by blood, but I promise you the circle is much more expansive than that. And they hold as much weight in my life as the ones that I gave birth to who then gave birth to my grandchildren. It's so important. Uh, and, and when we embrace children and, and take them in and love them as we love all of our children, it brings so much joy to, to you. And, and as a grandmother, I tell you what, I wear that hat proudly and uh, and I'm very, I'm very proud of my grandchildren, and I am very proud of the relationship I have with them. It matters. Uh, again, it was part of the reason for this book. Um, let me read you Welcome the Challenge. This one says, the more odious the journey to overcome an obstacle, the greater the gift that awaits you. I have come to believe there is no such thing as difficult, only varying degrees of easy, ERM. When faced with a challenge, approach it with the knowledge that you have the power and ability to overcome it and to succeed. When presented with an obstacle, change it to an opportunity. Be simple, by, by simply changing the word, you have already diminished its negative power. Imagine the gratification of having successfully navigated through, around, over, or under the obstacle. Appreciate the obstacles, that obstacles are there to be conquered. Remember the greater the challenge, the greater the gift. I have found that challenges are preludes to new beginnings and wonderful gifts. They're, these are rewards from the universe that we earn by keeping obstacles by meeting obstacles and defeating them. The key I use is to approach each challenge as if it's more a move on a game board. One of the funniest and most creative methods I figured out to get around an obstacle occurred when I first brought my aunt uh, with Alzheimer's to live with me. I wanted her to be ex accepted into a daycare program. The facility required an x-ray prior to acceptance into the program. An important thing to remember here is that because of Alzheimer's, she doesn't remember anything current for more than about 15 minutes. She refused to go to a doctor's office, so I found a doctor who would make house visits, home visits. Do you have any idea how difficult this is in today's uh, times? 
Then I had the doctor find an x-ray technician who also made home, home visits. And I promise you that's not easy. On the day the tech was due to come, my aunt announced she was not going to have an x-ray as they were dangerous. I couldn't believe it. Not to be outdone by my stubborn aunt, I called the tech and told him, when you come today, you can be anything you want except an x-ray technician. He was in shock. He asked, what do you want me to be? I said, I don't care. You are the expert at x-rays, so you will have to figure it out. I had been, it had been a very stressful day for me. I also told him that when I took him to meet her, he should greet her as if they had been friends for years. Rather than acknowledge she doesn't remember you, she will pretend she knows you and knows who you are. When he arrived with this huge portable x-ray machine, he greeted her as an old friend. He told her he had always wanted a photo of the two of them. We would, uh, so would she mind sitting and posing with him for the photo? She agreed and smiled. He sat with her and had me pretend to take a picture of them using the x-ray machine. The expression on my aunt's face said she couldn't figure out the machine, but she wasn't going to let us know she didn't recognize it as a camera. He then told her he needed to put aboard the x-ray film behind her in order for her to be in the right position. And did she mind if he took a picture of her by himself, by herself? She was flattered. I won that round with her. He got great x-rays. According to her, to this day, she hasn't had an x-ray. The experience became the foundation of finding ways to handle her without confrontation or confusion, just love and creative thinking. Welcome the challenge. And for all of us who have seniors or elders who are facing Alzheimer's, I promise you, without the confrontation, it's just a lot more fun. And, uh, and she was a happy camper for years. In fact, a side note was that at one point she told her doctor came and you know, doctors always ask um, uh, the patient what day it is and what year it is and so on. And my aunt could not remember any of those things. So on one of her, his last visits, he asked her the questions and she turned to him and she said, oh, you can ask Elaine those questions. She keeps all that information for me. So, so you can see that um, she had become quite comfortable with not having to face any drama or difficult situations because she couldn't remember. Dare to dream. Money is not necessary to do the things you wish to do. Dreams are. All you desire is possible. ERM. When we dare to dream, wondrous things can happen. Dreams are a manifestation of the power we have within our core being. They are our subconscious saying, wake up, you can do this. Recognizing them for what they are, a look into your greatest desires, work at making each one become a reality. There are no free rides in this life. There are always dues that must be paid. Embrace your dreams. Believe that you have the power to make them come true. Determine the steps you need to take to reach your goals. Be creative. There is always a way. Once you have put your desires into the universe and are working at making it a reality, it is just a matter of time until you see results. One of my ongoing objectives is to set as much as to see as much of the world as possible. I wrote this chapter while on a flight into Doho, Doha, uh, Qatar, having just left Kaching, Malaysia. This trip was possible because I worked at another one of my dreams to create unique jewelry and to empower people 
especially women, by teaching, jewelry making, and micro business development around the world. And so it goes. Our dreams, our dr one dream leads to the next, and all are doable. It is important that you realize you are achieving goals you thought unobtainable. Once you have the process down, so many of your dreams will become realities that it can be easy to miss recognizing them as your very own. I used to say I wanted to have a Rolls Royce complete with chauffeur. Eventually, I became part owner in a livery business in another country. It didn't occur to me until years later that my dream had been realized. While we did not have Rolls Royces, we did have Daimler limousines. I don't know if you're familiar with Daimlers, but for me, they look just like Rolls Royces. Uh, and to someone like me who is not a car enthusiast, the cars look alike. I never drove the Daimlers. We had drivers. The essence of my dream did come true, and what a ride, no pun intended. You are never too old to dream another dream. I'm sure that some of you have had these experiences. You should recognize that they are wonderful ways to realize dreams. So Elaine, uh, Robin has a, a comment or, or question. Mm -hmm. So I'm bringing her on. Yes, hi, Robin. hi, Elaine. Hi. Hey, hi, thank you so much. Um, I am enjoying listening to you read um, and listening to your words of wisdom. But I just wanted to say that one thing that really struck, strikes me is that I really love when women are able to share their wisdom to help elevate other women. And um, you know, we live in very precarious times. Everything is so complex and convoluted nowadays that you don't know what's the truth, what's fake, but what stands the test of time is the wisdom of the elders. Um, and if people would just humble themselves and listen to the wisdom of the elders, um, it doesn't change. It, it just, if you just listen to it, it's there and it doesn't change. My grandmother, you know, my mother, my sister who's on the call now, she's an entrepreneur. She has a, a very large business in the Bahamas. Um, mm -hmm. Very proud of her, but you know, she, she's in a foreign country running a business um, against the odds in a pandemic. So, you know, there's a lot to be said about women and elevating women and women humbling themselves to listen to the elders. You know, I work in a school and, and my students, they don't want to listen right now. And they're, I work in a high school. And they're not at the age where they're prepared to receive the, the wisdom of the elders. And, but I pray one day they will. But it's just, it's hard because now there's so many external forces and distractions. It's hard to focus and, and just focus in on the wisdom. And so I appreciate you and, and thank you for the wisdom that you're sharing in your book. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, let me say this, that you are 100% correct. And, and this wisdom that I'm sharing with you, did all of this didn't just come from me. Mm -hmm. This is me listening to my elders yes. and those who preceded me. And that's so important. You, you, you are absolutely correct. The yep. most important thing we can do is share what we have garnered from our elders and from okay. our ancestors and, and pass it on. It's so exactly. very important. Uh, yep. And our children do hear us. They don't acknowledge that they hear us, mm -hmm. but they do hear us. <laughs> I, I spoke with a grandson just before coming on. I said, you're not turning me on to listen to this. And he said, I already know all of it because you've said it a hundred times. Yes. <laughs> you don't even appreciate. And he said, no, you're wrong. I do appreciate you. Mm -hmm. I do appreciate what you say. I yeah. listen to you all the time. So they do listen and they do hear us. They don't let us know because God knows it would be too wrong to let us know. Right. Well, that's encouraging. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with that. They they hear me and they're listening, but you know they just don't want me to know that they hear. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I promise you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. 
Yes. Speaking speaking of the wisdom of um, that comes with age, um, can you talk a little bit about aging gracefully? What is some what is what is something you've learned in aging gracefully? Something you might want to share to others? Because um, I, I think it's a it's something we we all want to be able to do, but sometimes people don't know how to do it. <laughs> and um, I can. Get, I can only share with you what I have done, um, and, and with and the and the the uh, what is that? The vote is still out as to whether this is graceful or not. Trust me. <laughs> so, but what I can tell you is that because I work internationally, I keep my hair short because that's less trouble to be bothered with. Secondly, I don't use dyes and I don't change colors. What I have found that happens. Now, don't misunderstand that because there was a time in my life where for at least 15 or 20 years, I had every color in the world in my hair. This was when I was young and I didn't know what color my hair was because I was always putting, I was experimenting. And one day I woke up and said, okay, I've done all of that, so I'm done. And it's just gradually gone about changing colors and it is where it is. Um, but that's helpful because it's less time I have to fool with in terms of getting ready to go any place and or or in the middle of a pandemic I'm okay with zoom because I don't have to worry about getting to the hairdresser. Um, but that's one thing. The other is uh, I have always acknowledged my age I'm 78 today I'm I'll be that until April, but I'm more than satisfied and pleased with the fact that I have reached this age as successfully as I have. Um, and the most important thing when I think about it is love and laughter. If you laugh a lot and, and often at yourself uh, and extend love every place that you can hold no grudges because it takes up too much energy and too much time and trust me the, the fact that i don't hold grudges doesn't mean there are not that there have not been situations where i maybe thought i should have held a grudge okay but what it does mean is that i have enough sense not to bother with that i'm not giving anyone else my energy so it is only going to be used for good or not at all. And if I take time to harbor ill will against someone or to be angry and to hold a grudge, then I have to spend the energy that I need to remain healthy and moving forward on something negative. So I won't do that. And, and laughter, surround yourself with friends who will cause you to laugh as much as humanly possible. So I have friends, I laugh at me, my kids and my grandkids and all, all of us laugh at each other and, and at me. And, <laughs> and that's fine because that's how it should be. Um, my friends and I will get on the phone and laugh about nothing at all or everything under the sun. And sometimes in the last four years with the last president, it was really necessary to find ways to laugh as much as possible. Um, but those are just a few of the things. And exercise and get up when you don't want to get up and do something. Um, and find ways to share who you are with, your, with those coming after you or with your friends. It doesn't matter whether they're your children or somebody else's children or just people you know, but share. And, and, and always share with women, always share with women because that's how we continue. Um, one of the things that, that really caused me to be as excited as I am about women today is that when I was younger and I had my real estate company, there were not many women, at least not women of, well, there were just not many women of color or otherwise who were doing real estate full-time and I was. 
And it was a very lonely place because most women in those days wanted to talk about uh, their babies and diapers and children. And while I had children, I needed to focus on the business as well. And um, there were then very serious divides between the men and the women. And so it was a lonely place to be. And the few women who friend, befriended me at that time are still my friends to this day. Um, and I celebrate them in their generosity and their kindness and their forward thinking. And as a result, it caused me to zero in on women in all areas needing that continued support uh, and needing to know that they have value and that what they're doing in this world is important. And so that's, I think that's a little bit, Lisa, a little bit. Um, yes, okay, great. And um, Madeline just asked a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. Um, she's gonna, she has to jump off now. She just, but she said, just ask after, um, she wants to know what is the most important lesson that you've learned your biggest pearl of wisdom. Hmm. Okay. Um, that. I'm not, I'm not sure that I know which one. Uh, this, this is not, what I, here's the thing. I can say that those pearls of wisdom that I have cherished the most are all within this book. And, I, and I'm saying that because to single out one, I, I could say that um, the quote that starts the book, what the butterfly calls the end of the world, the, I mean, what the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the butterfly calls the beginning. I think that's very key because it reminds you that no matter what happens that's negative, the next turn will be positive. And I think that's very important. Um, my cousin, David, and this is also addressed in the book, when, who was a Tuskegee Airman. When I was a little girl, I was upset with uh, my sister and I came down the steps at our home. We were having a big family wedding of uh, one of the cousins and David and his children had flown in from, Calif uh, from Chicago into St. Louis. And I came down the steps pouting as children at 10 and 11 will do. And he looked at me and he said, you should never do that. He said, always smile because sometimes that smile that you share with others may be the only thing good that happens to them. And the other thing is that you look ugly when you frown. <laughs> so he said, if you don't want to be ugly in life, always smile. You can still make the same point without screwing your face up. I had remembered that from that day to this. And, uh, and, and one of the things I used to say in my offices when I was in real estate was I said, don't confuse this smile with me not being serious because if what's going on isn't right, I'm going to have real issues with that, but I'm not gonna let you disrupt how I feel about me by doing anything but smiling. So the smiling is important. And if you ever walk down a street or interact with family or others and you smile, you will sometimes see that it has a profound effect on that person. Generally, they'll smile back and it becomes contagious and you feel lighter and they feel better. And it is just a good thing. Um, there are many others, uh, some of which I've, I've mentioned here. Uh, I, I don't I don't know if I can single any one out, but, I, and I don't know if that answers enough of that question, but that's, that's my answer and I'm sticking to it. 
Well, that's that's great. And that that brings to mind another um, nugget of wisdom you shared that you're not going to waste your time with any kind of animosity or being bitterness. And, you know, bitterness is oftentimes tied to people who are aging. Um, but the um, I mean, it just made me think that those who've mastered the art of letting go and and changing their perception and what's in their really in their heart, they'll just naturally convey that on their face, exactly. you know, um, you know, because some as we age, our our wrinkles will set either with laugh lines or with a frown that you need to turn upside down and um you know it's much better to have those those laugh laugh lines in your face than the scowl you know permanently embedded there um and that has everything to do with one's attitude and choices we make every moment of every day um which i've i've learned along the way i um i saw another there was a question from robin in the chat she said, without divulging too much info, can you talk about a very challenging time and how you managed it? Uh, I can. Um, uh, again, uh, and I won't read you that chapter, but there's a chapter in this book that addresses that. When uh, when my husband and I uh, my husband decided to leave me and I don't mind sharing this because it's just in the book and none of these things have impacted me in such a way that I need to be afraid to share them or apprehensive about that so when he did uh, it was a very difficult time I was brand new in the real estate business and that was a male dominated world and i had to be careful i had been married for 15 years and i didn't know how to i was afraid of having to deal with uh, a lot of uh, of aggression on the part of the male population within the business so I didn't tell people for a, a long time until I could get my own, so to, until I wasn't as vulnerable as I could have, as I was in the beginning. And uh, so there's a chapter that talks about hugs and the importance of them. And again, it goes back to those women I said that were there for me, um, and one in particular, Linda. And, uh, and I, I had, figured out a way that because I still needed or still desired just the hugs that you get um, and the physical contact. And, but I didn't want to make that an issue and I did not want to share the situation out loud until I was less vulnerable and more capable of handling it. So what I did was every place I would go, well, first of all, Linda sent me a note after meeting me. Uh, I was um, a member of, I was uh, part of the Danforth Leadership Program in St. Louis and Linda was applying for, um, uh, to become a, mem a Danforth Fellow. And uh, so I had to interview her and she was just a strikingly wonderful, beautiful woman. And so in so doing, she sent me a note afterwards that said, consider yourself hugged. I, to this day, think that is one of, if not the most profound and important note that I ever received. Because as a woman, it was at a time when I was very vulnerable and fragile and uh, very concerned about how I was gonna handle the future. And this note that said, the simplest thing, consider yourself hugged, turned the tide for me. In the meantime, just as to address the, the public side of it, um, in order to be able to navigate that world, anytime I would enter any place, I would hug everybody. 
I would hug the women, the men, everybody. Standard that people just knew I was a hugger and that was it. They had no idea that those hugs were giving me the energy I needed to get through that period until I could get uh, out the other side. And by the time they found out, it was too late because I was more than capable of handling anything that came at me by that time. So I would think that that is one of those situations. Very interesting about hugging because I am a big hugger myself. And then with COVID, I've backed off on doing it. <laughs> oh, it's horrible with COVID. It's I horrible. know. It's, yeah. it's um, yeah, yeah. We've had to go without a lot of you know, the human touch during exactly. this. Exactly. Yeah, As, especially, you know, people who live alone. Um, you know, I realized how thankful I was to have my own partner, you know, living with me and, you know, during that time, and I was also going through my breast cancer journey uh, during, at the start of COVID. So mm -hmm. it, it made such a difference having just that another person that you love with you and supporting you. And um, Yeah, see, and, and the universe provides for us. So I had my grandson with me. And that was my saving grace because at least I could hug somebody. <laughs> so. And I know he's grateful to have you too. So we have a question or comment from Robin. Okay. We'll bring her back on here. I'm so sorry. I'm talking, I think I'm talking too much, but I just wanted to comment on what you were talking about your um, the smile theory. And and I my sister, she probably can, I hope she can hear me. My mom might be listening. I'm not sure, but that's just proves that the wisdom of the elders is a real thing because you don't know my mom and my mom is i guess i think she's gonna be 90 in september um when we were little she would always say i guess today they say never let them see you sweat but she would always tell us you know keep a smile on your face why do you have that grimace on your face keep a smile on your face all the time never let anybody know what's going on you know um and it's not that you're in denial but just keep a smile on your face because it's easier than frowning. And there was a song that she would always sing and the, the verses, I looked up the verse and I haven't looked at this song since I was a little girl. It says, it's a song called um, Open Up Your Heart. Mm -hmm. And one of the verses that she used to sing to me was, um, so that the sun shine in, face it with a grin, smilers never lose and frowners never win. So let the sun shine in, face it with a grin, open up your heart and let the sun shine in. She would sing that to me a lot. Um, and my mom was a type of, if you call her at three o'clock in the morning, she would have her perfect office voice. You would never know that she just woke up from a dead sleep. She would say, hello, this is Dorothy. You know, she would never, you would never know that it was three o'clock in the morning because that's just how she was. Her, her, what she presented was her way of being positive. So again, the wisdom of the elders connected again. Amen. Amen. There's no question about that. It, it's also, while it's a good strategy for just life, it's an excellent strategy for business because it goes back to uh, that quote, never let them see you sweat. The bottom line is you put that smile on and you step in that room. I used to sometimes take my hands, especially in real estate transactions, and some of them were very major. And I would put my hands behind my back so they couldn't see me shake. But I promise you, when we walked out of there, I had what I went in there to get, okay? And that was the important thing because there were so few women in the field. And, and so you could be in a room with, seriously, there was one time I was in a room with 12 male lawyers, one woman who was a secretary and me who was a developer. And that was it. And I had to deal with all of that. That's with the smile and body language. You can't, you cannot close up. You have to open up. And anyway, but that's, don't get me started now, okay? <laughs> but your mother is 100% is correct. That's it. And when you say waking up in the middle of the night, because I do business around the world, there's no such thing as night and day in this house. You know, it's just, 
get up, wake up. There have been many meetings that start at 12 midnight for me because it's 12 noon where I'm working and you know who I need to work with. And so you have to be up and ready. The standard rule is if I don't, if I'm not making any sense, hang up and call back. It means I need to wake up a little more. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Robin. And um, Juanita has a, a comment here that I thought was interesting to share. Um, Juanita is a is a Army veteran, officer veteran, uh, who we both, we both know. I introduced you to her during Blues Week. She says, I can empathize with you because I also worked for most of my Army career with men. And, and some of the men were cruel and verbally abusive to women who were supposed to work with them. Um, and I also used hugging and positive affirmation uh, to get, oh gosh, to, to get through some of my toughest deployments, especially to the Persian Gulf, Bosnia, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, let me give you one story. Uh, I don't remember whether this one is in the book. No, it is in the book. The, um, um, I had a business partner and um, my business partner for this particular uh, enormous transact, uh, uh, building, we were the leasing agents and uh, he was white. I was of course black and so he had biases, both racially and he had biases in, against women. And, um, but he didn't know he had the first bias. It was just evident in working with him that it was there. Uh, and so we had a meeting, we were, um, we were bringing in EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, regional office into this, um, office building that we were managing, which was the largest African-American owned office building in the city of St. Louis in those days. It was huge. And um, I had negotiated with the director of that office to bring their, their, they were moving their regional office to St. Louis. And so they were going to come in because I had solicited that sale, uh, that um, uh, lease agreement. And so, um, my partner's name was Sandy. And Sandy um, was just not used to working with women among other things. And so we were in a meeting and there were several women in this particular meeting because these were the people who had to oversee the designation of how the space should be set up for the regional office coming in. And so there were several women, but also men in this boardroom. And so somebody said something. And so Sandy said to me, he said, dear, can you put that? No, he said, honey, could you put that on the board? Meaning to take whatever the information was and put it on the board. There wasn't a single woman in that room that didn't freeze. I mean, everyone tensed, but bear in mind that this is a professional meeting. And so I can't not be professional. So I turned to him, I did not miss a step. I turned to him and I said, well, certainly dear, I'd be happy to do that for you. The room fell apart. He lost all momentum and it was clear that you do not ever call me honey in a room at all ever again in life. And so, and I <laughs> promise you, he did not. <laughs> well, that's great. I see a lot of, a lot of laughter behind our muted little videos of folks. Um, we had, um, we have time for one more question, which relates to a question I wanted to ask also. Um, someone wrote earlier asking, how did you, how did you get, become a jewelry designer? How did you first get involved with that? And then my question in general, um, how, how is creativity or why is creativity so important in our lives? Uh, the first question, um, I became involved with jewelry and became a jewelry designer because 
I was engaged to a gentleman from Senegal and he introduced me to the fact that women in West Africa wear beads around their waist and under their clothes. I had picked up some of these beads at a festival, but I didn't know they were waist beads. I thought they were necklaces. And so I had bought five different strands because they're very small beads. And so because I have five children, I do things in fives sometimes. And so I had bought these necklaces, um, what I thought were necklaces. And so he was coming to take me to dinner and I had left them on the dining room table and he glanced at these beads and I didn't have them on because they didn't go with the outfit I was wearing. And so he looked at them and he said, you know how to wear these beads. And there's a little, an old expression that some of you may have to look up is there's a little bit of sapphire in all of us, which was an old uh, reference to an old radio program of Amos and Andy and, and one of the women characters in that um, show. But anyway, so I refrained from being a little sapphire and I said, of course I know how to wear these, but again, didn't put them on. So the next time we were going out, I put the necklace, what I thought were necklaces on and I opened the door and he looked at me and he said, why are you wearing those around your neck? And, um, it just reminds you that you need to ask questions instead of making assumptions. So, so I uh, explained to him and he said, well, no, those are waist beads and you wear them around your waist and under your clothes. And so I decided that I would, I had time, I had just moved to the East Coast and I had time on my hands. I didn't have the kinds of social commitments that I had had in St. Louis because I was just here. And I hadn't let everybody know that I was moving out here. So um, I decided I would start a hobby. And, uh, and that hobby would be um, uh, making jewelry. And well, initially, it was just going to be doing the waist beads. So I was stringing beads and creating patterns. And it got to a point where the patterns were not adequate enough uh, I needed, I wanted to do more. And that's how I started with jewelry. And it, and from the beginning, because I've never had but one three hour formal class since I started, um, that's it. And, and now I teach and I lect and do lectures and so on. And, uh, and, and overseas, I'm considered a master teacher well, by some of my students here as well. But uh, that's how I got started in jewelry. In terms of creativity, it is really, really important, whether you are an artist or if you are a consumer of the arts or, uh, or appreciate the arts. That is being creative in your own way. All of that equates to creativity. And it is important because it is your release. When I'm creating jewelry or writing uh, poetry or books or any of that, it is a release. It is a form of freedom that allows me to be who I am and allows me to share that gift with others. It is very important and uh, it, it's, it's how I function. And I think uh, I watch of my children, of my grandchildren who are artists and I have several that are a very good artist. Um, I see them blossom because of the art and because there's nobody telling them not to be artists. There is, because here, I couldn't do that. They, they need to express that energy and in that way. And, and I think all of us should do that in whatever way that you feel so moved to do it, that's what you should do. Great, wonderful words of wisdom. And I think we're, we're approaching the end of our time, but I wanted to thank you so much, Elaine, for a fascinating and inspiring fireside chat. <laughs> it's great. I'm, um, I'm uh, interested in looking through your book a, a little bit each day, maybe this will be 
something I can turn to because like as you said, it's something you can enjoy. At, you don't have to read it in in order. But no. oh, in, fi in fact, uh, several who have this book find that they get up in the morning and they get a cup of coffee or tea and they read one chapter and that's and that's how they go about it. Let me read one last thing for okay. you, which is the mm -hmm. poem that I close the book out with, because okay. I think it is what we all should strive to be at all times, and that is a butterfly. I love butterflies. So the poem says, I am a butterfly. My wings are beautiful, iridescent rainbows, ever changing, ever constant, sprinkled with stardust to encourage free flight. Elusive transparencies designed to absorb wisdom, joy, love, sweet tears and laughter, designed to repel ignorance, pain, hatred, blue times, indifference. My antennas are long, fine, delicate life feelers reaching out, reaching in, dipped in dreams to know reality, touching tentacles sensitive to the breath of a newborn hummingbird, sensitive to the agony of an unsung song. Music explodes, wings unfold, I am a butterfly. That's it, Lisa. Great, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, final words there. And, and some very important question we have in the chat from Juanita is where can I buy this book? You can go on my website, which is elainerobnetmore.com. Uh, do, do you, can you, can you put, um, I'm putting it in the chat right now. Okay, no E on the end of Robnet, right? Right. <laughs> right, which I kept doing. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can go on my website to the uh, store there, and um, the book is there, or you can get it through Amazon. It's it'll be less expensive if you buy it through me than if you go on Amazon. But either way, and they can get an autographed copy uh, as I do. If you. If you go to the website, then I'm happy to autograph it for you. I can't, the only way to do it on Amazon is if you get it from Amazon, then you'll have to, um, when, when you're at one of your functions, Lisa, then I can sign it there, so. Right, well, great. Yeah, maybe, I mean, you're welcome to also bring some copies to sell uh, when you participate in the Follow Your Bliss panel on oh, Sunday, right. July 21st, okay. so. Um, or just, you know, bring coffees along with you. You're, you're a bit of a celebrity in downtown Silver Spring. <laughs> I, so, think, I, I think that we are so blessed to have, um, uh, to have such a, a positive um, art community in Silver Spring. I think that's really important and, uh, and, and, uh, I'd like to emphasize that we have a very effective and active um, Montgomery County Arts and Humanities Council Board that works diligently for all of the artists in the, um, in the Silver Spring area. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's important to note because some places don't have the luxury of having such an effective board. And, but we do, we do, we have a very effective one. Yes, we're very grateful for the arts and humanities of Montgomery County. Um, I mean, they they support all the arts and humanities in the throughout the county and are very um, very supportive of all of our work. And so we've we've been a grantee for over ten years now. So, and I always have to be careful because I'm wearing the hat of the board member and as an artist, so I always appreciate the opportunity to present as an artist, but I am always careful about that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, we're, we're fortunate to have you in the community as, as part of that board, as well as, a, as an artist and friend. So thank you so much, Elaine. It's, it's been terrific. And we, we will have a recording of this. If anybody would like to get it, just send me an email. Thank you, thank you to everyone. And, and I. thank you for all the work you do, Lisa, because you oh. are absolutely, uh, you are an angel in disguise <laughs> you absolutely are you are an advocate for the arts in silver spring and a welcome and positive um, leader in this community thank you so much for that well thank you so much elaine and thank you to everyone for joining us for dancing out loud and we hope to see you again soon have a great rest of the evening